Hi, everyone. Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Make Survey Grade 3D Models with Elios 3 and GeoSlam Connect. Uh, we're really excited to have you here today. If you could give me just one moment, uh, we're going to give about 30 seconds to those who are waiting to join, um, and then we'll get started. So we'll be right back. Okay, let's go ahead and dive in. So thank you again for joining us. Um, we're really excited to have you here. And I wanna share that this has been one of the most popular webinars we've ever offered in terms of signups. We have over 930 people registered as of right now. Um, we've only other, done one other webinar with, that even comes close. We had a little over a thousand uh, signups for a webinar we did last year that was focused on maritime inspections. Uh, so anyway, well, we're excited to, uh, to have you here and to talk about Elios 3 and GeoSlam Connect and the accuracy and precision that you can, can expect to see uh, from the 3D models that you can make with the Elios 3. Uh, so I will be your moderator today and your host. My name is Zach Dukowitz. I'm the content marketing manager here at Flyability. I also head up all of our communications efforts. Uh, with us, we also have Matthew Haslam, the product manager at GeoSlam. Uh, we have Charles Ray, the global field operations manager at Flyability. We have Adrian Briod, our co-founder and CTO here at Flyability. So we're doing the webinar a little differently today. Um, often we'll have individual speakers who have to do their own presentations. Today we're going to be uh, jumping in at different points because Matthew and Adrian uh, worked quite a lot on the testing we're going to present related to accuracy and precision. And Charles is our expert on how to fly correctly to get the data you need to make 3D models. So Everyone's going to be speaking to their expertise, um, and I think it'll flow quite organically. So just a quick overview uh, of what you can expect today. Uh, first, we're going to do an introduction. That's what we're doing right now. Um, then we'll dive into the first topic, which is how to make survey grade models with the Elios 3 and GeoSlam Connect. Charles will be presenting there primarily, but we'll have Adrian cover um, the Elios 3 and you know, what, what it does and how it can collect LiDAR data. After that, we'll look at um, the testing that we did with GeoSlam Connect. That's part two. So Elios 3 uh, and GeoSlam accuracy and precision testing. We did two tests. We're excited to share the results. Uh, and it's worth mentioning both of those tests are covered in white papers that we've written. We published them last week. We'll be sharing the links to those white papers um, when we email you tomorrow uh, with the recording of this webinar. Uh, and the last section of the webinar is why accuracy matters, examples of how 3D models are being used in the field and how the types of accuracy we tested for are actually important for real life applications. And then finally, we'll end the webinar with a Q&A. So actually on the note of the Q&A, I just wanna make sure to say, um, if you do have questions, please use the questions pane uh, you'll see that uh, in your dashboard and go to webinar. So hop in, ask questions at any point. Most of the questions we're going to be saving for the end. Some of them will be answered live if it's an easy question, um, but most of them will save for the Q&A at the end. So please don't hesitate. And then I want to reiterate because we often get the question, if we're recording the webinar, yes, we are recording. So please uh, know that if you miss something or if you want to share this with a colleague, we'll be sending you a recording tomorrow, again, along with those white papers I mentioned. 
So let's go ahead and dive in. So part one, how to make survey grade uh, 3D models with the Elios 3 and GeoSlam Connect. And Adrian's going to talk us through um, the Elios 3 itself. So I'm gonna hop off for a second and let Adrian take over. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you very much, uh, Zach. Uh, welcome everyone, super glad to, to have so many connected. And um, yeah, before we dive in, uh, I'll do a real quick intro about the Elios 3. Um, for those who are not yet aware about uh, some details about this product. Um, so as you know, flyability really comes from the visual inspection world. And, you know, historically, it's been our focus to do visual inspection with Helios 1, Helios 2. Uh, today, Helios 3 is our flagship product. We launched it in May this year. And, and really, it's been a step change in the world of indoor drones for inspection, thanks to its much improved ease of use. Um, this comes from the onboard FlyAware SLAM engine that makes the drone extremely stable in the air in all conditions, in very difficult uh, indoor conditions, provides situational awareness with the live map. It can help with the reporting by localizing all the defects in a 3D model on inspector. Um, now, another step change uh, with Helios 3 is really thought as a platform that will get further software and hardware options over the coming months and years. Hardware, thanks to the modular payload bay, and um, Really, the goal we have is to adapt to various needs that we've identified in various industries. And one of these needs that we've identified in some industries, including the mining world, is really this need for high accuracy 3D models. And uh, that's what we're really going to focus on today. Um, and um, you see the logo in the center, the 3D surveying solution. Um, it's provided in partnership with GeoSlam, uh, now part of FARO, which is really a leading company in the geospatial industry. And so they reprocess our data uh, and they go way beyond we do in our FlyAware engine um, by really um, uh, building on top of all of their experience in uh, building um, high accuracy 3D models. And so I'm really glad to have uh, Matt today with us uh, to, to share. Uh, and uh, their expertise. Um, now, before we get into this, and the question that everyone asks us is how accurate are these models, which is really the point also of this webinar and the white paper we published. Uh, we'll start with Charles, um, who, are, who is going to share some uh, really practical tips on what it takes to gather the data with Helios 3, um, so you get also a bit concrete on uh, what it looks like. On to you, Charles. Cool, thank you very much, Adrien. Um, so the first part when you want to uh, collect good data, uh, to, to process good data, is that you need to collect those data properly. Um, because uh, survey grade maps comes from high quality data captured by a LiDAR uh, that captured all the environment. Um, you don't want to have holes in your model, so you need to be well prepared uh, with uh, your flight plan. Uh, then you process it with a good um, with a good tool like GeoSlam that would really do a, a good reprocessing of all your data, and that will give you at the end a survey grade map. But you need those two aspects: so the good flight and the good scan of your area, and the good processing tool to be able to reach this high accuracy map. So. Without good data, you will never be able to have uh, a good map. So this is very important. And to get to that, we have identified a certain number of good practices that you should take in consideration when you are preparing your flights. So before you even take off, you should already know a little bit how your trajectory will be in your assets um, and already have placed a couple of good practices in your mind to know where you will do some maneuver, flight maneuver, to be able to capture those data properly. Zach, you can go to the next, uh, next slide, please. So uh, you can uh, open all the, uh, all the points. So those best practices, uh, the first thing is to really think about the LiDAR coverage. So uh, we are using the Auster LiDAR uh, that has a 90 degree angle and that we scan around uh, the drone, not everywhere around, but really on both sides, uh, both sides of the drone and a little bit forward. So you need to keep that in mind when you are scanning an area to make sure that you do not have any dead angle or a dead point that is not scanned. 
then you need to identify your takeoff because closing the loop for scans is very important because during the optimization of the map, uh, you need to have the same takeoff and landing point when it's possible. Um, then you have to activate the perform mapping flight that will do a calibration at the beginning of your flight with the drone. Um, during the arming, uh, you should not move the drone. This way, this calibration is done properly. So it calibrates the IMU and the LiDAR scan. Then right after the takeoff, the, the takeoff we suggest that you do an H-shaped turn around the takeoff place. This allows the, the LiDAR to really scan the area uh, around the takeoff place. So you really have a dense point cloud really at the takeoff. And that will help when you will land at the end of your flight to really uh, close the loop and do the merging between the beginning and the end of the flight. Then when you fly, we recommend to keep uh, a steady speed. So no fast acceleration, no complete stop. Do not stay too much at the same place for too long because the library do not like those kind of data. Um, when you pass through a small opening, it's going to be important to scan the area before and after to really help the SLAM after to be able to merge those two rooms and to have a clear identification of where it starts and where it's finished. Um, we also know that the LiDAR will give you the highest accuracy when you are flying from one meter to 10 meter to a wall. So a radius of maximum 10 meter around the drone will give you the highest accuracy. The LiDAR will still capture to up to 30 meters. So uh, in foot, it's the best uh, distance would be between three foot radius to 30 foot radius around the drone. Uh, even if the LiDAR still capture data up to 30 meters radius around the drone, um, you will have more noise if you are scanning uh, an area that is very far away. So if you manage to keep the same distance between the wall, it will really help you. Not staying too much at the same uh, spot, exactly same spot. Um, anyway, it wouldn't be very helpful as you would have always the same data coming from the LiDAR. And at the end, really try to land at the exact same place and you take off. If it's not possible uh, to land at the same place, it's not a big deal, but you need to, we will have to tell to the software uh, during the post processes thing that you are not landing at the same, same area. This way, the SLAM will not try to merge the beginning of the flight with the, with the end of the flight. So those are good practices. It doesn't mean that if you do not follow all of them, you will not be able to get a good model. It just means that by following all those steps and trying to respect those during your flight, there is a way better chance that it's gonna be very easy to get a, a high accuracy model and that the accuracy will be much high. Uh, can you go to the next slide, uh, Zach, please? And, and maybe Charles, uh, if I may, uh, I think it's worth mentioning uh, for uh, those not experienced in mobile mapping solutions that uh, these are fairly similar to many mobile mapping uh, handheld devices typically, um, which, which are definitely also uh, requiring different practices than uh, terrestrial uh, ground lidars, for example. Yeah, 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 exactly. Always a handheld lidar, you still have to follow some of those practices, otherwise your data will not uh, be good at the end and you will have the same problem for accuracy. Um, so here you see an example of, of flight trajectory. So that was in a mine in Switzerland. Uh, we had initially uh, just a sketch of this mine. And you can see the yellow dots are the flight trajectory that I thought about, uh, that I uh, had planned to do before uh, even taking off. So each red cross is uh, the area where I did a 360 degree turn. So you can see that each time that you have a junction between multiple galleries, I do this 360 degree turns to be able to scan properly those, those two or three or four different tunnels. Um, and I'm each time I'm entering into a, a, a tunnel, I'm trying to cut my trajectory when I'm back. This way I close the loop in every single gallery that I'm, I'm flying through. Um, the purple uh, little sign is where it was pretty narrow, I decided to fly sideways to go in those area uh, to be able to scan uh, better what I was that had in front of me. 
This is about 200 meter long, 600 feet, and 20 meter uh, of heights. So I know that in advance. Uh, that was my the information I got before I started flying in there. So I already decided in advance that I would more or less fly at 10 meters of altitude, um, because was over 30 feet, because that would give me a high accuracy on the top and on the bottom of the drone uh, for my lighter. You will see in, a, in a about two slides um, the 3D model of this place, um, and you will see that it worked pretty well. So all that just to show you that you can prepare your flights, and you should always prepare a mapping flight uh, in advance. So you should know where you will fly, how you will fly. If you don't have the blueprint or you don't have the sketch, it's not a big deal. You can also do a recall flight with the drone before, so you understand a little bit how the facility is, and then you do your mapping flight after by trying to follow in all those uh, good process and good uh, flight techniques to really have a good coverage and making sure you have the highest map, uh, highest accuracy map as possible. Uh, Zach, you can go to the next page, please. So this is how it looks uh, the model in GeoSlam. Uh, Matt will talk more about GeoSlam after, uh, but we thought that it was interesting to show you that was a, a mine in, um, in Kazakhstan a couple of weeks ago. Um, we, uh, this is only one flight with the drone, um, and you can see that we could cover a pretty large space, even with uh, an interesting geometrical uh, shape. We still had a good signal almost everywhere. Uh, we didn't flew further on the back uh, blue tunnel on the top of the screen because we were starting to lose the signal with the drone. But for the rest, we had a perfect signal. And Zach, you can continue, please. And you can play all the animation. So on the bottom right, it's the mine that uh, you saw the flight trajectory before that is uh, mapped. Uh, on the top left, it's a um, storage tank. Uh, under it, it's a boiler. On the top right, it's a sewer that Adrien did. Um, and on the top right is, um, is the mine that I was talking about. So here, it's a mix of three different flights that I, that I merged together to build this, uh, this map. Um, and that is the map coming from uh, GeoSlam that have been reprocessed with another software to have this nice animation. Uh, so now I think I will pass um, the word to Matthew, if I'm right. Sounds good. And I just want to mention briefly, you're seeing some latency in these 3D model videos. Uh, that's just because they're embedded in the slide. Uh, we'll be playing videos that are embedded natively and go to webinar as we go on in the presentation. So those uh, will play much more smoothly. I just wanted to note that briefly, but uh, I'll pass things back to Matthew now. And thanks again, Charles. Yeah, thank you for that, Charles. Um, really good. Um, just a quick intro, my name is Matt Haslam. I'm from GeoSlam and today I'm gonna to be talking you through the GeoSlam Connect when using Ilios 3 and the accuracy and precision that we can expect from the Elios 3 with GSM Connect. Firstly, though, I'd like to talk a little about, a bit about um, GSLAM for those that might not be aware with the company, uh, just to give you a bit of background on what we do, what we specialize in, and um, our partnership with Flyability. So GeoSlam is the market leader in SLAM technology for both hardware and software, making it really easy to capture and connect data from the world around us. In 2013, we pioneered the first SLAM handheld system with the ZEB-1, um, which has really led the way in SLAM systems. And since then, we've been developing both hardware, software, and our SLAM algorithm to maintain our position as the market leaders in SLAM technology. The aim of GeoSlam is to give people the power to collect geospatial data in those difficult environments, whether that be indoor, outdoor, or underground, but especially in GNSS-prived environments. 
as the system doesn't require any GMSS to uh, process and collect um, 3D data for your models and maps. So the partnership with Flyability has brought together really Flyability's years of experience in inspecting inaccessible environments um, such as mines and utilities management with GSLAM's experience in the SLAM sector to create a mapping tool for uh, mapping and surveying really challenging and inaccessible environments. And hopefully, as we can see from the webinar today with, with 900 attendees, it's been a, a massive success and everyone's really interested and wants to find out more about how they can map their inaccessible environments. Zach, if you can move on to the next slide, that'd be great. Thanks. So firstly, a bit about SLAM. Um, SLAM stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, and is the process of mapping an area whilst keeping track of the location of the device in that area without the need for any GNSS. In the case of the ELIOS 3, we use a LiDAR system. LiDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. So we measure the distance to an object by illuminating that object with a active laser pulse. We use 100,000 or hundreds of thousands of points per second and combine all of those points to create a active model of our current environment around us and then combine those models um, over a period of time to create a, a larger model of the environment. This means that we can move around the environment whilst capturing data, which is a massive benefit over terrestrial systems where you have to be stationary to capture your data. So we can capture a vast amount of data in a significantly shorter period of time compared to a terrestrial laser scanning system. If you can move on to the next slide, please, Zach, that'd be brilliant. So we're going to be talking a lot about the ELIOS 3 with GSM Connect accuracy and precision today. So I just wanted to cover, uh, cover some of the key terms of what accuracy and precision is, and then go into a bit of detail as to the different types of accuracy. Um, so that when you're going through the white papers and inspecting kind of the results that we've come up with, you're really clear on what that value and what that accuracy result actually means. Um, and how that um, how that can help you in understanding how the how the Elios three with GSM Connect can be suitable for your um, for your data collection. So, firstly, precision. Precision is the degree to which further measurements show the same result. So, we can see on the graph or sorry uh, target table here that the two um, targets on the left show a low precision. The two targets on the right show a high precision. Now they show a high precision as they're showing the same measurement um, to the same degree. So we have a close grouping, um, close grouping of those points of those measurements in comparison to the left, where we have a dispersed grouping of those measurements showing a low precision. Accuracy is most universally defined as the degree of conformity to a measured quantity to its actual benchmark value. So here we're looking at how close are we actually to the target center. You can see the two targets on the top have a low accuracy as we're not measuring a value close to the intended target center. Compare that to the two targets on the bottom where we can see that we have a high accuracy as we are hitting or close to the, the target center. So it is important to know the difference between accuracy and precision, um, especially as we kind of go through these white papers and, um, and look at a bit more depth as to the differences between accuracy and precision and understanding those values for the ELIOS 3 with GSLAM Connect. Within accuracy, we're going to break accuracy down into local accuracy, global accuracy, georeferenced accuracy, and then drift. 
when we're talking about global accuracy, sorry, when we're talking about local accuracy, we're going to um, talk about when an object can be seen or viewed from a single position. So if we take the dimensions of a single room, we can see all four walls from a single position, and we refer to that as local accuracy. In comparison, if we're talking about global accuracy, the object cannot be seen from the same position. So we're talking about measuring points or distances between two different rooms, and essentially the system accuracy, taking into account not only the LIDAR, but the SLAM used as well. Later on in the discussion, we're gonna have a look at um, georeference accuracy, which is the measure of global accuracy plus any inaccuracies caused by the alignment method. Finally, we'll have a look and discuss the system drift, which is the error as a percentage with respect to the distance measured or traveled. Now, the drift is really used to identify the expected error as absolute error grows in the absence of any ground control or um, GNSS or GPS points. So we can use the drift value to estimate um, how inaccuracies could propagate through a linear scan without using any control or any GPS. If you can move on to the next slide, Zach, that'd be great. So in this paper, we're going to be talking about survey grade accuracy. Now, the term survey grade accuracy really depends on the use case and application of both the hardware and software. So the LEOS 3 with GSM Connect will meet many requirements for both surveying and mapping in accessible areas. However, we're not saying that the LEOS 3 with GSM Connect will meet all survey requirements by stating that it is survey grade. So the rest of the presentation will cover the accuracy and precision of the system and will allow you to make an educated decision as to whether the system will suit your survey needs or not. Thanks, Zach. So the first test that we undertook was local accuracy and system precision. Um, this test was undertaken in GSM head office where we have control um, and we'll dive a bit into the details here, please, Zach. So testing local accuracy and precision. You can see here on the left two uh, images of the test environment uh, at the GSM offices in the UK. The image on the left shows and the data set captured with an Elios 3, and you can see the red line there being the flight trajectory that was taken by the pilot. So this was our um, test data set. And on the right here, you can see our reference model, which is our control. Now, this is a uh, capture of the same environment using a Regal VZ400, and uh, sorry, which is a, a terrestrial laser scanner. And that was aligned using RISCAN Pro um, to create to create this high accuracy model. So to test. Uh, local accuracy, we did plane-to-plane -plane analysis. Um, we used six planes that were scattered around the test environment and compared them from the Elios 3 data with GSM Connect to the control. We also tested um, range noise evaluation to assess the precision of the system by fitting a plane um, to the extracted planes of the point cloud and identifying the um, standard deviation from that plane fitted to the uh, plane on the point cloud. If you can go to the next slide, please, Zach.
So the test results. Well, for precision, the mean standard deviation between the ELIOS 3 scan and the reference planes was plus or minus eight millimeters to one sigma. So essentially 95% of all points or two sigma fall within plus or minus 16 mil of the reference planes. When we're looking at local accuracy, um, we investigated the mean absolute normal distance between the ELIOS 3, the reference model, and the control, which was captured with the Regal Terrestrial System. And we saw that there was an average mean normal distance of about eight millimeters between these two planes. And all of the comparisons fell within plus or minus 16 millimeters. Some, so some uh, fairly accurate results here, both assessing local accuracy and precision. And on the next slide, we can see um, the those results in a bit more bit more detail and we can see the six planes and six tests that were uh, assessed and the results in full so here we can see that uh, for precision most of the results fell within plus or minus eight millimeters um, with just test six falling out to plus or minus 15 millimeters and when we're looking at the local accuracy, we use the mean absolute normal accuracy to take into account both the negative changes and the positive changes to ensure that the test was as fair as possible. And we're displaying an accurate local accuracy result. Thanks, Zach. If you can move on to the next slide where we'll talk about global accuracy and georeferenced accuracy. So we undertook some further tests in a um, industrial facility in um, in Switzerland, which we can see here. Um, so this industrial facility is approximately 70 meters by 40 meters. And again, we used the Regal VZ400 uh, as control as it's a, a terrestrial system with, with very high accuracy, <coughs> sorry, that collects very high accuracy data. And to test the global accuracy and georeferenced accuracy of the LEOS 3 with GSM Connect, we captured this test site three times with the LEOS 3. Um, and we'll take a look now as to the um, flight path used and the area captured in a bit more detail. So here we can see a the test setup of the Regal in the industrial facility. Um, there were quite a few stations required. It is a fairly large facility, and the overall capture time for um, all these different test stations was approximately six hours to, to capture the whole environment. Um, and you can see on the right here that we had the retroreflective targets that we used for control. Now these retroreflective targets can be picked up by the intensity recorded by the LIDAR on the LEOS 3. So they're a really good way of being able to um, georeference your data back to your control using, using the LEOS 3 with, with GSM Connect. And that feature will be coming out in GSM Connect 2.3 very shortly. Thanks, Zach. So six hours to capture with the terrestrial laser scanner system, and it took eight and a half minutes to capture the whole site using the ELIOS 3. Here you can see the um, flight path that was undertaken, and this was carried out three times. Each time we tried to um, follow the same flight path so we're as accurate as possible. On to the next slide, please, Zach. So hopefully we've got a video showing the sped up process of the um, capture of the ELIOS 3 here. Um, 
So if you can go ahead and hit play, Jack, uh, Zach, that'd be great. Hopefully. So. Oh, and uh, just a heads up, Matthew, you'll have to unmute yourself. Uh, it automatically mutes you while a video plays. Thanks, Zach. So here we can see a sped up um, flight of the capture environment. And you can see here that we're using the capture techniques and best capture techniques um, that we discussed earlier by doing 360 turns and um, going into environments that we'd previously scanned just to kind of close the oh, I'm so sorry. I think it muted you again when I tried to play the video again. <laughs> sorry about that, Matt. But they are um, they are recommended and they are kind of best practice to make sure that you get a really good accurate result at the end of your data capture. Thanks, Zach. If we can move on to the next slide, that'd be great. Do you want me to go ahead and play this video as well, Matthew? Please, thank you. No so problem. in this um, in this video, we're going to see a overview or fly through of the Elios three scan, which is on the right, and, and just, the just scan. It's about to mute you again. Play. Thanks, Zach. And the scan captured um, by the Regal VZ four hundred on the left. So you can see very clearly, same environment. Obviously, we've got um, a bit more noise coming out of the Elios 3 scan and some areas that were not captured in full completion. But we captured the intended areas uh, and the targets as well. So we could carry out the uh, test required to complete the accuracy report. Thanks, Zach. So, the global accuracy tests. So, we had the 15 retro reflective targets positioned around the um, scan environment. And we took pairs of these targets and measured the distance between these pairs in both the control point cloud from the Regal VZ400 and from the Elios 3. Uh, data that was processed in GSM Connect using standard processing parameters. We then found the residuals between the um, LLS3 distances and the terrestrial laser scanner distances and calculated an RMSE for each of these residuals. From here, the, we then found a percentage of the length of distance traveled between the two points. So we could essentially find a, um, a drift value over that distance. And we then found the mean error or mean average error of the RMSE to give ourselves a global accuracy result. So this really is assessing the, the system accuracy by looking at the accuracy, uh, the local accuracy in combination with the SLAM accuracy by assessing points from across the whole test environment. So we can see here that we've covered essentially the whole scan environment by um, measuring these different point pairs that, that are scattered around the, the scan environment. Thanks, Zach. On to the next slide and we'll have a look at some of the results. So the RMSE of the target-to-target -target distances for the three scans 
to the reference model was 35 millimeters and the MAE as a percentage of distance was 0.16%. Um, so if we're traveling over a hundred meters in a, in a straight line, we're kind of expecting to see a drift of around 16 centimeters, but the global, um, global accuracy result was, was I think exceptional, showing a, an RMSC of, of 35 mil, so a, a system precision accuracy of, of 35 mil. So I hope you found the local, global and precision accuracy interesting. Uh, I'm now going to pass over to Adrian, who's going to take this one step further and going to discuss the georeference accuracy. Um, so thank you very much, and I'm sure I'll speak to you all shortly. Thank you, uh, Matthew, uh, and uh, I want to point out again um, that it's been a uh, Really fantastic to have Joslam and Matthew in the loop here, uh, providing their expertise, uh, including in uh, contributing to the methodology here of this testing. I think it's one of the most thorough testing of a commercial uh, mobile mapping solution out there. And um, yeah, again, like Matt mentioned, here our goal is definitely to uh, provide you with data that uh, you can rely on to, to decide for yourself uh, whether our solutions match your survey needs um, and so here uh, what we're going to address is um, indeed um, another way to characterize the global accuracy it's when we georeference the alias 3 scans to the reference scan uh, with two different techniques and the first one is uh, to illustrate uh, typically a situation where we only have a reference model around the takeoff location and we want to know how much we can trust the rest of the model beyond the takeoff location. And um, you know that fits a use case where uh, typically uh, there is no way to georeference any part of the model in this inaccessible area because, well, it's inaccessible. So here uh, to simulate this, we have aligned uh, with a cloud to cloud um, uh, algorithm, the 15 meters around the takeoff location, which is highlighted in, in a color, um, here on the um, top view of the full asset. Um, and then we're looking at um, what is the error between the targets on the Helios 3 scan uh, in the remaining, uh, in the remainder of the scan and uh, the reference scan. And um, we characterize this um, depending on how far these targets are from the takeoff location, again, to have this notion of uh, what is the drift um, so that we can also uh, project ourselves in, in various other uh, conditions and, and have a sort of a drift uh, characteris characterization uh, of the error. And next slide, Zach. The, the um, results were um, that for the XY um, error, in average, uh, we had a drift of 0.1%. And that's on the next slide, uh, Zach. And for the XYZ uh, error, the average drift was 0.2%. Uh, and so um, that's um, in percentage, in absolute error, uh, the average RMSE uh, for the XY, uh, so just the 2D plane uh, from the top view uh, was 55 millimeter. And for the full uh, 3D error, uh, 110 millimeter. And so, of course, um, this way to georeference uh, data uh, only around a subsection of the model um, is going to be uh, actually uh, less accurate uh, than if we have uh, ways of aligning um, the scans with the ground truth or with uh, georeference ground control points over the entire scan. Uh, and that's going to be uh, the next section. Um, but uh, I think this is really an important uh, metric for all of the scans in inaccessible areas, which, which don't have any uh, GCPs in them, typically. And uh, also just want to point out that um, uh, this error here uh, is really both uh, the accumulation of uh, the error uh, from 
possibly error in the SLAM process uh, or imprecisions in the LiDAR scans and this georeferencing uh, method. And I would even also add that the centroid picking of each target used for characterization are also influencing uh, this uh, total error value, which is really the accumulation of plenty of factors. Uh, on the next slide, I believe we have the tables um, that uh, show more details. The goal here is really just to uh, uh, bring to your attention uh, that what we share before are the average errors. Um, so it, that doesn't mean it's a guarantee that that will be the error. Sometimes it will be lower, sometimes higher. Um, you can also see that uh, we've been pretty thorough by doing the scans always three times and the analysis on all three alias uh, scans. Um, and um, have um, here also uh, all the different uh, details per target. On to the next slide. So, like I said, um, another way of aligning um, the you know the scans to uh, ground truth or to uh, georeferenced uh, model is uh, through ground control points. And uh, in general, it's preferred that these are um, used um, with um, yeah their location being all over um, the scan. Um, and here in red, you see highlighted the four uh, targets that. Uh, were used for aligning uh, the LUS3 scan to the reference scan. Uh, Matt mentioned we'll soon have on JustLAM Connect uh, 2.3, probably early next year, the ability uh, to directly on Connect to have uh, these target extractions and uh, automate, automatic um, registration uh, of GCPs. Um, and so here um, we have uh, an improved uh, absolute accuracy um, which we can see on the next slide. Uh, since the alignment is um, using, uh, of course, uh, more of the model, the average uh, XYZ error uh, being almost half of the previous one at uh, 65 millimeter. I want to point out that here, uh, for now, just LAM only allows a rigid uh, alignment. Uh, and uh, we can also expect further improvements in the future once uh, there will be the feature of a non-rigid alignment where uh, the GCPs that are uh, identified um, and um, who, who, which are georeferenced allow to uh, really influence the SLAM algorithm and improve the accuracy of the whole model um, with a non-rigid uh, alignment. Um, so on moving on also again with uh, the more detailed tables, um, we don't need to spend time on this. Um, to, to wrap up the you know, precision and accuracy discussion, um, on the next slide, we have a summary um, of um, where, we, where we stand uh, with these results. And really, um, what we can say, and Zach, can you move on to the next slide, please? If we were to summarize, huh? um, so Zach mentioned the precision. Uh, and uh, really this key uh, value is uh, that um, a two sigma precision means 95% of the points will be at plus minus 16 millimeter, typically of uh, where uh, a plane is. Um, the average global accuracy uh, is 0.16% uh, of a distance measured. And when we do the uh, global accuracy um, after georeferencing uh, will have a 0.2% drift uh, over the distance traveled. Um, and so while the precision uh, really depends directly on uh, the LiDAR which we use, which is the Auster LiDAR, um, and which may be um, maybe a little bit inferior to some uh, similar systems, um, the global accuracy um, is really what's uh, very important in uh, many uh, surveying jobs. Uh, and this, uh, we can definitely claim it's really on par with uh, the leading uh, market um, standards in terms of um, mobile mapping devices. Um, now, just again, a disclaimer, it's important to uh, understand that these values come from uh, this test we did in um, this uh, industrial facility uh, with a certain uh, capture and processing options. And of course, um, 
many things can affect the errors uh, and precisions and accuracy that uh, you will experience uh, depending on the asset itself. Uh, in particular, symmetric assets um, will uh, create uh, more challenges. Uh, some very symmetric assets cannot be mapped with a LiDAR system um, because uh, the LiDAR really need some geometry to, to lock onto. Um, and some capture techniques um, will, uh, will, like Charles said, uh, improve uh, the modeling. Now, um, to be clear, the industrial facility that we found also has quite some challenges, especially lots of doorways and lots of different rooms, um, and of course, a pretty large uh, area. Uh, okay, now uh, we'll conclude with uh, a few examples from the field and explain um, yeah, how these, these accuracy discussions tie in with real jobs that need to be achieved with um, these models. Um, so we can move on, Zach. Um, the first um, field example we wanted to share, um, and you know, this one comes really from a market we've clearly identified as um, a real, um, really important market for mapping inaccessible places. It's in the mining industry. Um, where there are lots of places that really just are too dangerous to access and where the equipment to map these cavities or areas um, is uh, definitely not as powerful as uh, sending in uh, an indoor drone. And here, typically, we had uh, a customer with an ore pass that was clogged. Um, this rock here in the picture is called a hang-up. Um, and they've been really struggling understanding where that was exactly. Uh, and uh, to know that is crucial because the way to unclog this pass is really to put explosives at the right place. And so having an accurate 3D model is really what's needed to go somewhere in the mine from another location, do a drill and put the explosives really where they need to be to, to break that rock. And so um, in this case, um, you know, knowing uh, how, well, you can trust the 3D model that Helios 3 will capture, um, allows to know whether uh, we can trust our drilling and trust that we'll get the job done. Um, and so in this case, uh, you know, it corresponds to uh, what is my drift. Um, and uh, when I georeference the Helios 3 model with the mine model that I have, which really will only match at the takeoff location because uh, there's no mine model um, inside this ore pass, especially not uh, comprising the hangup um, since it's inaccessible. And so um, here, I think it will be clear also on the video, uh, what is the benefit of using Helios 3 and uh, the capabilities. And so you can play the, the video, please, Zach. And the capabilities really of um, Helios 3 have been um, very, uh, Align with the needs of uh, that customer. Um, and Adrian, which, just which, a reminder, it will mute you as soon as I hit play, just a reminder. So you have to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm it's not play. a bug, it's a feature. So what you see here is um, the result of um, a quick processing in GeoSlam of uh, the flight. I think the next video will be footage from the actual flight. And um, so you could see really that um, uh, the, the scan is, is clean. And uh, even though that asset was uh, to some extent symmetric, I mean, it's, it's a bit of, uh, of a cylindrical shape. Uh, there, there was no issue with the, with the LiDAR mapping in this case. Um, and just to show you how how, it, how easy it was to capture that 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 data. Andrian, you're muted again. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, I, I forgot again. So so here uh, it shows uh, how how easy the capture was. I mean, um, and maybe you can skip thirty seconds, uh, Zach. But you could see we had to bring the drone through a manhole first, and then. Um, here it's um, uh, maybe two meters or six feet wide, but there, there's of course no problem for Helios 3, which is a 50 centimeter uh, diameter and thus can really 
get easily in all of these uh, narrow spots um, and then um, fly up this path um, until the hand cap is in sight. And the, the, the GoToWebinar does not allow skipping ahead for embedded videos like this, so apologies. It's okay. You get the full um, the full uh, story then. Um, and so here you can see the hangup is um, easily identified and um, you could see before the scan resulting from, from that flight. Okay, I think we can move on. And um, I'll go really quick on the last uh, example since um, <clears throat> We need to save a little bit of time for the Q&A. So Zach, I'll let you bring back the slides. Oops. Yeah, and so so the, the last uh, use case, it's also available on, on our website for, for more details, but it's just an example where, you know, uh, you may have an inaccessible area, but uh, you may still be able to uh, dereference um, multiple sides of the scan uh, or, or you, you may have ground control points at, at multiple uh, places in, in, in the scan. And uh, here, uh, just to highlight um, also how, how you can use the um, accuracy metrics that we shared before uh, to know how you can how well you can trust uh, our LUS3 plus GeoSlam scans um, in this situation. Um, here we had um, a power generation company uh, which had um, an abandoned uh, power plant and uh, they couldn't access one part which um, was uh, really full of rust. And so LUS3 was able to quickly collect LiDAR data in, in all this area. And uh, typically the georeferencing can happen on uh, multiple spots. Um, you can get an idea of uh, the scan that we could deliver uh, when Zach, you play the video. I'm going to hit play now, so if you'd like to talk over it, just a reminder. Adrian, you are muted. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I, I had to unmute myself twice, actually. There, there's really more yeah. details uh, on, on the website. You can just here get, 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 uh, get an idea of um, this point cloud and and if you know you you, you could see uh, on both sides uh, um, one inside one was outside you you would very likely have ground control points and it's very useful to uh, know how well you can trust that sort of uh, 3d model if you need to do excavation from the outside to to work on the decommissioning um, and yeah i think um, now we should move on uh, i'll just uh, really conclude by by saying um, we, we've, uh, with LUS3, really introduced a tool that can map uh, accurately in accessible places. And it's really the beginning, I think, of um, us discovering, and, and you all in uh, who are attending, discovering what are gonna be the use cases for such a tool, which really did not exist before. Um, LUS3 can, can really just fly in, in areas that, that no other uh, platform can. And um, I think we'll keep discovering new use cases. Um, we are really looking forward to hearing back from you in terms of what you're doing with it, what are uh, your uh, requests for future features. Uh, and of course, we're here to help understand further this product, understand how to use it at best. And voila, let's uh, open the floor uh, possibly for a few questions, right, Zach? Absolutely. Yeah, we have several good questions, which I'm excited about. I want to mention real quick the two um, stories that uh, Adrian just covered are case studies. So I'll make sure to include links to those case studies. And when you get the links, you'll be able to see these videos in there. And this case study in the decommissioned power plant, uh, we also got some testimonial footage from our key uh, contact over there. So if that's of interest, I'll make sure to include all of that in the email I send you tomorrow that has a uh, link to the recording of the webinar as well. Um, yeah, so let's switch to the Q&A. Uh, Matthew, if you could join us, and Charles, if you're still with us, if you could also hop on, and then we will dive in. Okay, great. Um, so we've got some uh, really good questions, and feel free to continue to ask questions. I do want to say right now, we're at the hour. Um, the rest of the webinar will be devoted to questions. 
if you need to go, we understand, no hard feelings. Uh, but if you'd like to stay and have a question answered or see what other people asked, we encourage you to do so. If you want to watch this later, uh, like I said, we're recording it and you can pick it up later on the hour. So uh, we'll probably go a little over 15 minutes. Uh, we had a lot at 15 minutes, but we do have a lot of questions. So we'll be here to answer, but you know, feel free to stay uh, as it's of interest and as you have the time. Uh, so the first question is from Tony. Tony's asking if you could please tell me what the resolution is for the system when scanning a volume approximately 50 is 50 meters by 50 meters by 80 meters. So Tony's just wondering what the resolution might be for a volume of a cup here. So I don't know if it cut for everyone, uh, but for me, you, you cut uh, a bit, uh, Zach, so I couldn't hear the full question. Um, by, the, by the sound of it, it seemed like a question from Mathieu. Uh, sorry. Um, the... Yeah, I think so. It's a question about resolution. And Tony is asking what kind of resolution uh, we might be able to get when scanning a volume that's approximately 50 meters by 50 meters by 80 meters. Okay, so you, you, you'd be able to get a pretty high resolution and, and certainly enough to capture um, volume stockpile data. Um, it completely depends on your, your flight path, but bear in mind the size of the environment of 50 by 50 by 80. I think you could, um, you could S or snake along the stockpile and make sure you have really good coverage of that stockpile. Um, before processing the data in GSLAM Connect. The resolution would definitely be higher than uh, 10 millimeters, but bear in mind we're looking at a stockpile calculation. Um, I'd actually spatially decimate that data in, in GSLAM Connect down to, to 20 or 30 millimeters. Um, so you have some really manageable data to work with. Um, so yeah, I think we'd, we'd get a, a resolution definitely higher than, than, than 10 mil, but I personally wouldn't think it's necessary, so we'd probably recommend uh, decimating that that, that down. Um, again, you know, it depends depends on how inaccessible the environment is, on how much um, crisscrossing over the the stockpile that you can capture. But yeah, I think you'd get a, a pretty strong coverage um, of your stockpile. Excellent. Good question. Though. Thanks, Tony. No, that's that's incredibly helpful. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, we have a question from Canyon who's asking, does the Elios 3 have a timeout that limits how long flight is flight is similar to BLK to go's time limit for walks? And I think they're talking about something beyond the, the battery life. I think this is about the LIDAR sensing if I'm following, but does this question resonate for anyone on the panel? So as far as I'm aware, um, there's there's no timeout on the lidar and there's no timeout on the slam. Um, I think the limitation is the battery life, and I think Charles or Adrian would be best to to expand on the the battery life of the Elios three when the lidar is connected. Yeah, usually the flight that we are doing are between uh, eight minutes and eight minutes thirty. So uh, so our stockpile that the stockpile we mentioned before is completely doable without any issue. Um, so yeah, about eight minutes with a speed of 1.5 meter per second. Um, so we can cover a pretty, pretty large space. And I think it's it's worth mentioning that now with Connect 2.2, there is a workflow for merging uh, multiple scans. So uh, whatever um, cannot fit in one flight can be done in multiple flights and then merged uh, fairly smoothly on uh, Connect 2.2. Got it. Thank you, Adrian. Um, we have Harold who's asking, uh, you mentioned an optimal flight height of 30 feet or 10 meters in an underground scan. Um, the typ typical UG drift heights are around five meters. Can you please clarify is what Harold's asking. So the, the, the lighter will get the, the highest accuracy when you are uh, between one meter and 10 meter to a wall. So as long as it's in this area, you will get a pretty accuracy map. Then if you are in a, a wider area than that, 
for example, if you are uh, flying in a void in a mine, you will be able to def define your flight trajectory um, in a little bit a different way, but you will still be able to have a pretty high accuracy map simply by uh, following the wall at up to 20, 25 meters, the scanner will, uh, the LiDAR will catch good data, but the highest accuracy would be between one and 10 meter uh, radius from the drone. If I understand the question, the worry was whether we would have to keep away at, of at least 10 meters. And uh, of course not uh, actually, yeah, between one and 10 meters is optimal. And to be very clear, LUS3 is uh, a very versatile platform that can really go through very narrow and tight spaces and uh, no no worry flying in a drift uh, typically yeah got it thank you thank you both um charles there's a question i think is going to be for you from nick who's asking what's the best technique for capturing uh, lidar data inside a large cylindrical void like a storage tank um, could you describe, do you fly to the top and work your way down, fly from the bottom up, or can you describe what you would suggest for collecting LiDAR data in a storage tank? Um, so storage tank is you usually do not have any, uh, any dust. So depending on the size of it, or you can just do a small uh, fly inside the facility, I would do a 360 degree turn right after the manhole just to really nicely uh, mobilize the, the, the area around just after it, the manhole, and then flying in a circle inside the tank would probably be what works the best. And then straight down and out, you should have a pretty good uh, data set. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Charles. Um, we have Steve who's asking what type of file is used as a deliverable to clients? Um, yeah, what, how would you share this data externally for a client? So once the data is processed in Geoslam Connect, we have a multitude of export options, um, E57, LAZ, LAS, PLY, and TXT. We also have um, Geoslam Draw, which is an add-on to Geoslam Connect to allow you to work with the near data for uh, CAD models. and that can export to RXP, um, DXF, these kind of CAD formats. So a multitude of multitude of formats really that can kind of be suited for, for anyone's third party integration to their full workload. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, oh, we have a question from Gary uh, who's asking, in underground mine operations, the survey control is sleeves inserted to rock and a sphere is used to capture the survey control as well as paddles are now being used. Is this something that GeoSlam is working on? Does that question make sense to you, Matthew? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, we're essentially gonna be, or we, we are working on and currently in the final stages of testing um, a georeferencing tool for GeoSlam Connect with um, the Elios 3, not using spheres, but using retro reflective targets. Um, so you'd have a 200 millimeter or 300 millimeter retro reflective target that's geo referenced into your mine environment using a total station. And the Elios will capture those targets and automatically detect those targets um, for geo referencing. Then when you go to process the data in GSLAM Connect, all you'll have to do is provide the Elios 3 data and the target control file of your um, targets in your mine environment. So the, the centroids of those retroreflective targets. So same process, however, utilizing uh, retroreflective targets and not, not spheres. Good question though. Excellent, thank you very much, Matt. Um, we have Artem who's asking, have you compared two scans of the same object made by your device with two control points? Two, can you say the question again, please? Um, have you compared two scans of the same object made by the Elios 3, but with two control points? I'm not sure. Two. 
question makes sense. So, so maybe the question is uh, how repeatable is uh, an illustrious scan of the same thing? Like uh, if the distance between two targets is two meter one time, is it going to keep being two meter, right? I think that's one way to interpret it, yeah. I'll let you go ahead, uh, Matt. Yeah, so we, um, in the accuracy test where we had um, three Elios 3 scans all capturing the same targets, uh, we did have a, a, an assessment that we've not published on the precision of um, the Elios 3 scans within the within themselves essentially so comparing Elios scan 1 to Elios scan 2 to Elios scan 3 uh, but those results haven't been published if you think that's something that's that's of interest in having a look at the repeatability of the system then we can we can definitely look at publishing those results um, regarding the three scans in comparison to the control so the regal scan we had a um, very similar result from each of the three Elios 3 scans to the control distances, showing that um, the system is very repeatable and the results would be kind of as expected, uh, showing a, a repeatable result of the same environment. Um, but we've not we've not published those results yet, but that's something we can look into. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a follow-up question from Gary. Gary had the question about working in a mine in survey controls where you insert sleeves. Um, so Gary's asking as a follow-up, uh, these inserts are inserted into rock. So are the reflectors Matthew's talking about, can they be inserted into the rock? Does that question make sense to you, Matthew? Sorry, just lost the, lost the mute button. Uh, Yes, exactly. Yeah, working with some um, target providers that um, have rock vault applications, so they can easily be drilled into the into the rock face, um, and kind of leave a leave a magnetic stud that any target can be attached to. So these uh, rock vaults can be geo-referenced, and then the targets can be attached to the stud um, as and when needed to be able to provide a, a control point or control target that the Elios 3 can pick up. Uh, so yes, they can be they can be attached straight into uh, the bare rock or, or, or shockery or similar. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from Jorge who's asking about stockpile measurement. Um, so besides getting an accurate 3D map in difficult areas, can we use this solution to calculate volumes uh, and get stockpile inventories um, in difficult areas, you know, confined spaces. Um, yeah. Yeah, Sorry. I mean, we've actually done some case studies on, one was an assault mine on stockpile measurement using GeoSlam software, and one was in a cement plant using um, GeoSlam again with LEOS3 LiDAR data to get a stockpile measurement of a clinker, which is a material used to make cement inside a clinker silo. Um, I don't know the, uh, the details, Matthew, I'll defer to you, but I will um let, I I'll try to include those uh those links as well in the email I send out tomorrow so that people can see what we've done with stockpile measurement. But Matthew, if you could address it in a more technical way. So as well as GSM Connect, we have a, an additional software package that is specialized for stockpile and tonnage, um, sorry, stockpile volume and tonnage calculations. Uh software is aptly named GSLAM volumes. Um and in there, you can load in your, your stockpile data and accurately report on your stockpile volume and tonnage over time. The software is specially built for that one application, so it's highly specialized to do that job and do that job well. Uh, the benefit of GSM volumes is that if you're measuring the same stockpile again and again, um, you know, repeating scans once a week, maybe once a month, and you'll really easily be able to track and report on your volume and tonnage change over time. And the software will provide you with a tabular view, graphical view, showing your volume change of your stockpile over time, and then provide you with a report as well um, on your stockpile volume. 
So especially for some uh, underground or indoor stockpiles that are really hard um, to scan, quite dangerous to scan by the user having to walk up to, sorry, walk over the stockpile or inaccessible in the sense that you can't uh, scan the high areas due to kind of field the view of your terrestrial scanner, then the Helios 3 really is the kind of perfect solution to, to send up to your inaccessible stockpile and capture all of that data from above. No one has to be walking dangerously over the stockpile and you can then push that through GSLAM Connect into GSLAM Volumes, which can accurately report on your volume and tonnage of your, of your stockpile. So yeah, I think Zach, that's a great idea, sending out uh, some of the case studies. Um, so we've got some really great And, and I guess we, I guess stockpile monitoring could, could be worth its own webinar because we've indeed identified uh, so many um, customers uh, really in need of such a solution uh, because there are so many of these uh, inaccessible stockpiles indoors and um, lots of, uh, uh, yeah, bad solutions to that that leave people wondering how many how many how much of the product uh, is uh, is in store. And so, uh, indeed, uh, also once um, Connect 2.3 is out early next year, the automatic registration uh, of uh, each uh, scan will make it really a breeze with just some volumes uh, to to very uh, frequently monitor um, the the stockpiles uh, with Helios 3. So. Uh, but thanks for for the question because that that uh, allowed to to yeah go on this tangent and and share about uh, this also very interesting use case which we haven't mentioned uh, so far in this webinar. Absolutely, um, I will say uh, we're almost twenty minutes over the hour and we still have over a dozen questions, so we may need to table some of these and take them to written answers. Uh, but it's a great indication that there is a lot of interest on the topic and a lot of um, learning to be done, right? A lot of education that we can uh, support. So um, if we don't answer your question today, please know we're going to do our best to follow up in writing. I also want to say this is only the beginning of a dialogue. Um, I always like to say that toward the end of a webinar, it's really just a jumping off point because we want to make sure that you get everything you need um, as far as learning and getting your questions answered. So if you don't get your question answered today, um, you can see Adrian and Matthew's emails up on the screen right now. Uh, don't you know hesitate to email them and we will also try to do what we can to get answers out to each of you uh, to the best of our ability. But that being said, I'm gonna ask just a few more questions. There was one about uh, pricing for GeoSlam Connect. Um, Matthew, could you tell us what the additional cost is to get a GeoSlam Connect um, uh, annual package along with the Helios 3? Uh, just one second. Right, do you want to ask another question? I'll get back to that one. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Um, Outdoor flying came up. Uh, how do you, how do things improve if you're flying outdoors where you have GPS signals available? Can you take in GPS data as well? Is a question that we had from Rob. Uh, maybe I'll take that to you, Charles, or, or you, Adrian. So right now, uh, the drone is not equipped with a GPS, so um, you will not have the GPS point in your geo reference uh, GPS referencing in your images so you would still need to do it manually after by ground control points got it thank you charles um and lucas is asking uh if we wanted to run inspector 4 and geoslam what computer specifications are recommended so geoslam requiring more uh power uh so we have the exact uh, uh Ah, uh, settings that are needed. I think it's uh, 16 gigabytes of uh, RAM, uh, the uh, preference, uh, the optimal, and uh, Intel Core 5, uh, E5, I think, um, for GeoSAM. For Inspector, it's, you don't need as much as it's not post processing the data, it's just showing what the drone have captured. So you are not doing reprocessing that requires more uh, power. Got it. 
Uh, thank you very much. Sorry. We'd recommend 32 gig of RAM if you have it available. Maybe an AMD Ryzen 7, um, i7 7th generation, and then Windows 10. Um, as long as you've got some free space on your PC, you're good to go. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, we have a question on whether we have any tips we can provide on how to distribute the GCPs to maximize global georeferencing accuracy? Yeah, so kind of the same setup as with any um, standard surveying practice, having ground control points around um, the entire uh, site, that being kind of one good ground point, one GCP north, one south, one east and one west, will really help in constraining the alignment of the of the um, scan to ground control. Um, in the examples that we showed from, from the white paper, you can see the difference that having control around the whole scan makes to the accuracy of the georeference point cloud. You know, we had a result from ground control points being distributed around the site of around 60 millimeters. And you compare that to comparing to control using ICP on just one section, just one corner of the scan, and we're looking at like 100 mil. Um, so the only real recommendation is, if possible, have control all the way around your scan or around your site. But we know that in scanning inaccessible environments, this isn't always the case. And you may have to have four ground control points at the start of your scan before going into that inaccessible environment. And that's perfectly fine. There's no issue with that. Just to be sure, make sure that the, the kind of team are aware that that will hinder the, the alignment process and add a level of inaccuracy in comparison to having control around the whole site. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask one last question. This will be the last one of the day, but um, like I said a moment ago, uh, we will be in touch and we really do want to answer all your questions. So please use the two emails on the on the slide in front of you and um, and reach out if you didn't get your question answered and we'll do our best to reach out to you um, as best we can. So last question for today though, Sebastian is asking, can we share more information about the process of creating a flight plan? Uh, I know Charles, you've already covered this, but um, can you uh, speak any more about that process and, and what you do in a given environment? Um, so it, it depends a lot on your environment, actually. Um, so you will try to take in consideration um, the size of the asset, uh, if there is multiple entry points, um, the geometry of the asset, obviously. So what you need to uh, to do to have the best mapping is really to consider how far you need to go, how close you need to be to the walls to have the best accuracy possible with your, your lighter. Um, you need to be careful about your transition when you fly from one room to another or uh, um, through small openings or manholes. Um, what else? Uh, the dust, uh, high dust, uh, high uh, concentration of dust would create some noise on your uh, on your um, on your lidar uh, mapping, uh, simply because the dust will be seen uh, by the lidar and will stop some of the of the beams. So, I, if possible, you should try to fly a little bit higher than the minimum uh, altitude. And you need to consider the orientation of the beams that goes out of your lighter. So it's a little bit uh, a case by case um, a kind of uh, preparation. Uh, but you want also uh, uh, to make sure that you close the loop uh, between different rooms, as I, as I showed in uh, in one of the slides. Um, there is not. There is no single answer to that because it really depends on your envi environment and there is multiple ways to do it properly. Um, but it's difficult to answer uh, like that for uh, as a general uh, matter, it depends on your assets. 
Got it. Thank you, Charles. I mean, I think that's a topic we could probably do a whole uh, separate presentation on. And I know you often uh, work with people to train them about, you know, optimal flight paths for different environments. Um, I think we'll stop here. We've gone 25 minutes over. Um, again, there's a lot of questions, but uh, we, we plan to be in touch and we plan to do more webinars like this. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Matthew, Adrian, Charles, um, especially Adrian and, and Matthew, the testing and the work uh, done to get us to the point where we could actually make this presentation was very involved. Um, it took a lot of time in the field, uh, a lot of writing to get the white papers done, which will also go out tomorrow with this recording. So thank you uh, so very much for taking the time and, and uh, collecting all Zach, I think you just forget uh, to get back to uh, the one asking the question about the price. Uh, <laughs> maybe uh... I didn't have that information. I just didn't want to put you on the spot. Yeah, just, just on that. Um, thanks, Zach, and good point, Adrian. Um, so the Connect uh, for Elios 3 uh, annual subscription price is around 3,700 euros, and that's for a one-year subscription. For a perpetual license, uh, so you can always use GSM Connect with your Elios 3, it's around 13,000 euros. Sorry, and I, and, and I believe there is uh, uh, also an option uh, if you are already a Geoslam uh, uh, Zeb Horizon or Zeb Revo owner and uh, already use Connect to uh, upgrade your uh, Connect uh, software to also be compatible with Elios 3 uh, with, with a lower fee. Lower fee. Yeah, that's around 15, 1,500 euros if you're already a Connect user and you just want to upgrade to be able to process flyability data as well. Thanks, Adrian. Excellent. Um, well, okay, thank you so much. Uh, thanks everyone who stuck it out. It's, you know, we've gone quite long, but we really appreciate you being here. Um, that being said, I think uh, we're gonna close it out for today, but we'll be in touch. Thank you again. Thank you, Zach, for everything. Thanks everyone for the interest. Thank you very much, all. Thanks, Zach. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Thanks.